Fasten your seatbelts. The foremost authority on 9-11. The best-selling author of Methodical Illusion and a researcher extraordinaire. Rebecca Roth is about to step up to the microphone and launch into Reality Check, where the light will shine brightly upon the truth. Once again, it's live from North Vancouver, British Columbia, where you never know who you're going to meet. It's the Rebecca Roth Show, starring Rebecca Roth. And I'm your host, Ramjet. You just left me speechless. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my, my, my. I've yeah. heard that a few times <laughs> lately. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, I'm not even going to touch that. <laughs> Are you... Doing a little sailing at the yacht club, maybe? <laughs> uh, I can never tell. <laughs> Woo-wee, that just about took me off my chair. Oh, wow. All right. For those of you who have read Methodical Exposure, you're probably getting it. You're probably understanding what this little inside <clears throat> comment is all about. Well, welcome to the Rebecca Roth Show. I'm so glad that those Canadians let you figure out a way to... Uh, Use your data plan and join me. All right. Fasten your seatbelts, ladies and gentlemen, because we are going to talk uh, about uh, some of the stuff from 9-11. And it's just going to blow you away because it's, it's blown me away, actually. So, you, But your publisher did tell me last week that there's a town called Dilly, Texas, and that I should visit there someday and do the show from <laughs> Dilly, Texas. That would be a Tuesday daily show. Uh -huh. That might be. So you never just never know where I'm going to be. Yeah, okay. Well, one time um, we were doing a daily news show. We do a daily news show over at our membership site behind the galley curtain. And Ramjet <clears throat> said daily so fast it sounded like dilly. So we have a dilly dilly kind of a joke going on. Uh, we have dilly dillies on Tuesdays and then hump day comes on Wednesday. Um, but yeah, we have lots of fun over there. So if you're interested in the, just the current news, and <clears throat> you know, I can't help myself, but if, you know, I've been so involved with this whole 9-11 thing for several years now, uh, four books now, we have four books out. Um, and for those of you who missed this, if you're a member uh, for the Coast to Coast Insider program, I was on uh, with George Nouri, uh I think it was September 26th. I don't, I, I just remember it was a Tuesday because there was so much stuff going on. I had uh, book number four, uh, book signings, um, deliveries. <clears throat> I had to get to and from books and the publisher and it just was kind of crazy. And then uh, that showed up and I got like, you know, a four or five day notice. So, and it's kind of crazy. So I have to go to a hotel because I don't carry a phone and I don't have a landline because I'm not landlocked. And so it's kind of a, you know, uh, deal, but I think it was the 26th though. Anyway, George Nori, coast to coast AM. And if you're an insider and I think it's like five bucks a month, uh, you can you can go back and listen to it. It'll eventually end up on their YouTube uh, channel, I'm assuming, but I just don't know when. So, and I don't have a recording of it. So anyway, it was kind of fun. Uh, book four released uh, the first part of September. So, let's see, around the third or fourth methodical uh, exposure, book number four in the methodical series came out. Uh, got onto Amazon. Uh, and then I think around the 10th, the hardbacks came out. So the uh, Kindle's out, the soft cover's out, and the hard cover's out. And I'm happy to say lots of people are reading this. And it's a mind blower. I was over at your uh, publisher's warehouse not too long ago. And he showed me the little corner where your 25 books that you thought people were going to read <laughs> that he'd reserved for your Methodical Illusion. And and it, we were laughing because it was just a little teeny corner. And he said it just gradually expanded and expanded. And now he's got almost half of his warehouse with methodical illusion, methodical deception, methodical conclusion, <laughs> methodical exposure in two different flavors, softback and hardback. And he just shook, stood there and shook his head. And I thought, <laughs> you know, what are you going to do? She's probably going to write another one. And then we'll both have to shoot her. <laughs> Okay, well, <clears throat> I really didn't think anybody would be interested in reading my uh, first novel. Uh, it went into the top 10 on Amazon, though. So, and thanks again to George Nori, Coast to Coast AM, and uh, the listeners there. Wow. Wow. Um, so that was kind of fun and uh, crazy, and it really set off an avalanche 
of uh, in airline people showing up mainly, but air traffic controllers, a lot of people in a lot of a different aviation, man. I, I have had air traffic controllers from, <clears throat> you know, you know, that area around Langley, Virginia. Yeah, in that area. Uh-huh. Uh, I've had air traffic controllers from uh, top se top secret, uh, high test security Air Force bases come forward. There were so many people that had so much information from the Pentagon, military intelligence, uh, other forms of intelligence, DEA people. It just has been the most incredible thing. I, ha I never, ever dreamed... You know, when I was doing methodical illusion and deception, I was pretty much on my own. And I was finding the information and then using my experience in the airline uh, to just kind of bounce things off of. Uh, but then, wow, for book three and four, hmm, wow, lots of people helped. Well, you know, I'm somewhat privy to all the people that come in your way and to give you information. And I really had to laugh at George Norrie because... One of the things he said towards the end of your interview was, do you really believe this stuff? And I'm thinking, you know, maybe you could have said that the first time you had her on the show when, uh, you know, it was basically <clears throat> she was on her own. But now she's had so many people come and give her information that the verified things she has thought, things she has written about, and uh, have given her more information that <clears throat> she's been able to write about. Of course she believes it, George. Well, my answer to him really was... Um that it's not a conspiracy. We have data and we have a lot of government data. We have FBI reports, we have uh, radar, and we have that one of the most important things that we uncovered was the meta tagging, which is when you save something to a computer, it's time and date stamped. And so when you start finding uh, <clears throat> voices on a, vo a voice file, that is marked terrorist before anything happened on 9-11, 6.37 a.m. on 9-11-2001. Now, first off, I need to tell you that in the airline industry, and every year in our recurrent training for pilots and flight attendants, we had code words and we, we uh, practiced our protocol for hijacking. It never changed all through the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. It never changed until after 9-11. The code word... The code words, there was actually two or three of them that we used to let the pilots know that there's a hijacker in the cabin because they can't see. The door's locked, they have a peak hole, and they're sitting facing forward, looking out for other planes and uh, where they're going and following the charts and that sort of thing, talking on the radio. So they're not busy looking out their peak hole. Uh, at what's going on in the cabin. We are their eyes and ears. So uh, the FAA had a set of protocols for us to follow in a hijacking. We never ever used the word terrorist. So when we were looking at nearly a terabyte of Freedom of Information Act data that was eventually given out to somebody who just kept asking, and it was several years worth of Freedom of Information Act requests that I ended up getting my hands on. So when I was joined by pilots, other flight attendants, uh, military intelligence guys, military air traffic controllers, civilian air traffic controllers that work at major centers around the country, uh, and different people that we started sharing the files, and then it dawned on us that, hey, wait a minute, take a look at these files and what time they were uploaded to the FAA headquarters in Washington, D.C. And who, who would have thought that at 6.37 a.m., an hour and a half before American Flight 11 pushed back from the gate, that somebody in FAA headquarters, somebody in FAA headquarters would know this guy was going to be a terrorist and was going to say, we have some planes, we're going back to the airport in an Israeli accent. <laughs> Whoa, how did they know they would call this, a it was ter Mark Terrorist. Well, that's just not a word we use. So it got people's attention that were in aviation, in the airline industry, and in air traffic control. Because we, uh, we dealt with hijackers. And until um, September 12th, or the afternoon of September 11th, 2001, the word terrorist was just not used in aviation. And the FAA hijack training protocols were all for hijacking. So the other day, now... <clears throat> 
Uh, I have a membership site where we can, uh, I, I, I'm starting now to really, now that this last book is out and i am uh, got a little bit more time, really beefing up the 9-11 information. Now there's some exclusive interviews and information in there that you're not going to get anywhere else. And uh, we do a daily show there and you get a discount on the stuff in our online store, the books and all that jazz. But I was working, somebody asked me, one of the members asked, sent me an email and asked me to explain uh, the hijack protocols. And if the hijackers were possibly crew members, why didn't they follow the hijack protocols? So I was writing my response in a blog so that people can ask more questions, make comments or what have you, and the Behind the Galley Curtain membership site. As I was writing, <clears throat> this is just mind blowing to me because I've been so deep into this. I started with American Flight 11, Betty Ong, who called out first, and then Amy Sweeney, the two flight attendants that called, and these were my red flags because they were, I was walking in their shoes. I knew what they were supposed to do, and I knew what they didn't do. And then I started to see all the conflicting information between the two of them. And I also learned that uh, on American Airlines, you can't sit on your jump seat at three right Betty on and talk on an air phone. So then I knew she was on a cell phone, and then putting that together. She was on the cell phone for about 27 minutes to reservations and no flight attendant in the world would call a reservations line because you always put on hold, sometimes for 10 or 20 minutes. Now in hijacking, <clears throat> you're just not going to make a phone call, period. Or the hijacker sees you and you're, you're dead, basically. I mean, they got a, anything to kill. They could kill you with their bare hands if they thought you were on a phone talking to somebody that was going to nix their program, right? The hijack. So I started uh, writing this blog and <laughs> I was like, okay, I spent so many years sitting in a jump seat that the fact that she kept saying, and she said this about four or five times, maybe six, to the reservation agent that she's sitting at the jump seat at three right. And that's the farthest aft jump seat on the 767 on the right side. You know, remember, this is a two aisle airplane, much like a DC-10, L-1011, if you were ever on one of those kind of planes, 747, two aisles left and right. So all of this time I was looking and listening to what she said, and then I was writing the protocols. And so just to let you in on this, in the event of a hijacking, uh, pre 9-11, on 9-11, on that day, because the protocols were still in place, took them a while to change all that. The, this, was, this is how things would have gone. The f hijacker would come to one flight attendant. They oftentimes watched the crew, so it usually didn't happen in the first 10 minutes um, <clears throat> because you're climbing out. No, nobody's going to get out of their seat because it's really hard to walk when you're on a climb out. And that climb out lasts a good 10, 15 minutes, which was also a weird thing about 9-11 because all this stuff was supposed to be happening. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> you're, you're pulling out of Boston, climbing out in a 767. Uh, you're not going to get out of your seat and be you know, slicing and dicing or, you know, killing a high. You can't even, I mean, it's like mountain climbing, only worse. So <clears throat> I always thought that was kind of a weird part of the story. But as I, I was writing this blog, it ended up being kind of a long, detailed thing. Uh, for many reasons, we have this protocol set up. Now, the FAA has had it in place for a long time, like since maybe D.B. Cooper or before. So... When uh, the hijacker would go to a flight attendant, the rest of the crew was to sit down and not draw attention to themselves. Remember, Dina Burnett told her husband, Tom Burnett, on Flight 93, exactly those words. Dina Burnett was a Delta flight attendant. And so, she, I mean, that's exactly when she, I saw that. I was like, well, yeah, she's a flight attendant because that's exactly the protocol. That's exactly the words we were told over and over and over every year. Sit down and do not draw attention to yourself. And what that meant was that every other crew member that wasn't directly involved with the hijacker was to sit down and not draw attention to themselves. In other words, take off your wings and name tag, cover your uniform uh, jacket or parts, with, you know, take it off, put a sweater on, borrow a sweater from the passenger, sit in the passenger seat. And so that's what we would basically fade away, become a passenger so that there's no other detailed crew members that could this guy could deal with you they just let him to deal with one flight attendant only and on those particular flights there were plenty of empty seats that they could have sat in and not drawn attention to themselves right yeah well <clears throat> on uh on american flight 11 there was probably 
think they had 80 some passengers. So uh, there's about 100 empty seats. And that's a lot. That's a lot of empty seats. You guys look around, you, you don't get on flights anymore and see 100 empty seats. But I have seen that. Um, so yeah, there was plenty of seats. So I'm sitting there typing away on this blog. And it dawned on me that, okay, there's somebody up front. And usually this is one of the flight attendants that's up in business or, cl or first class, whatever. Usually first class is usually closest to the cockpit. Now, not, not all airplanes have a first business end coach. Some of them have first class and, and coach. That's it. So right up there by the cockpit in the first, let's call it first class. Those are usually the flight attendants closest to the cockpit, but not always. Sometimes the hijackers would watch and they'd be in coach and they'd watch for the meekest, mildest, softest, sweet talking, yeah, hi, what can I get you to drink? Little girl. I mean, they may pick the most junior girl to put the knife to their throat or whatever. And so it doesn't matter. Whichever flight attendant, whether they were in first class or coach, was one-on-one -on -one with the hijacker. Everybody else was to scatter and disappear. Look like a passenger so that, there, so that you did not look like a flight attendant. As I'm writing, I'm looking at this and I went, Betty Ong said, how many times I'm in my jump seat at three right <laughs> on a phone? And I'm like, no, how could I have missed that? I, I guess it's because I was in the jump seat so much and I thought, well, yeah, she's a flight attendant. She's in the jump seat. But here's where she should have been. She should have been in any given coach seat, pretending to be asleep, covered with a blanket, somebody's sweater, her own sweater, whatever, uh, and not looking like a flight attendant. Oh, well, if you're sitting in a flight attendant jump seat on a phone, you're looking like a flight attendant talking to somebody that's going to wipe out your hijack plans, right? And I just dawned on me like, this is just another one of those red flags about the whole fake story. I was like, oh my God, she's sitting in a jump seat. Now, of course, um, Amy Sweeney, the other gal that called out, the other flight attendant, uh, she said that she was sitting in the second to the last row in coach. But the problem with her story is that she said Betty Ong was sitting there right next to her. But Betty Ong kept saying over and over she was in the jump seat at three right. But if you were in an active hijacking, I'm here to tell you this is the protocol at the time of 9-11. You would not have sat in a flight attendant jump seat. Period. And you sure as heck wouldn't have been on a phone in a jump seat. <laughs> or unless you wanted instant death. Because there's no way with a hijacker in the cabin, even as long, I mean, that airplane, it's really a long, you know, double aisle. So there's things going on on the left side, on the left aisle, and things going on on the right aisle. She was on the right aisle, way in the back. But that doesn't mean, now, according to their story, there was one more than one, not hijackers, terrorists on board. So if that were the case, you really, really wouldn't have been sitting in her jump seat. Now it took me all this time to realize <laughs> that there was a big, another big flaw in the story. Why do you, <clears throat> why do you think they changed the hijack protocols after 9-11 if the hijack protocols weren't ever used? I mean, we never saw any stories that, uh, you know, claimed that the flight attendants were saying the uh, code words. Why do you suppose they changed them after 9-11? Well, I think uh, from what I understand now, um, <clears throat> they're, they just kind of basically aren't ever going to deal with quote unquote hijacking. It's all, uh, you know, uh, distress or duress situations that they aren't calling it terrorist or hijacking. They just changed the name. Uh, but yeah, the code words are all different. Uh, and I have no idea. Uh, but I, I do know one thing. I probably got a thousand letters from flight attendants from every single airline across the United States that said, you know, I always found it really weird that after 9-11, <clears throat> we were never told the details that really mattered. And which would be how, if, because none of them actually said this, none of the flight attendants that con called out, none of them actually said there was a hijacker inside the cockpit. They said other things that were able to be translated to indicate that maybe that were the case. One of the things Betty Ong said, I think the guys are up front. That's terminology we would have used for the two men 
pilots. We always refer to, if there were two guys up front, we'd just call them the guys. You know, if we're waiting for the crew bus at the airport or at the hotel and the pilots weren't there yet, we would say, and the guy, the driver of the shuttle bus to the airport would say, or to the hotel would say, are you guys all ready to go? We'd go, oh, no, the guys aren't here yet. So when Betty Ong said that, people on the ground that weren't flight attendants or the media said, oh, yeah, that, that, that comment right there meant that the hijackers, but no, that's not what, what it meant. To a flight attendant, it meant that the pilots were up front. So anyway, she never, neither, none of the, hij of the flight attendants, none of them, not one of them, gave the specific information and not one airline after 9-11 to this day would actually talk about or discuss any of the details of 9-11. But anybody that asked, man, I've got the laser beam eyeballs, don't ask that question from the instructor of the class. And I don't care what airline you're in, if you raised your hand in recurrent training for flight attendants and you asked a question, anything about 9-11, you got laser beamed out of the room. I mean, they, this, you know, it's one of those if looks could kill kind of thing. So... Uh, yeah, this is kind of a universal thing, and I, I just find it just fascinating um, that in, no matter what airline you were in, if you asked that question, you were, <clears throat> you were not welcome to ask another question. I mean, the instructors just frosted. Uh, so anyway, it was kind of interesting for me to see that I'm still at this day still finding details that I thought I was kind of in a sense blinded to because sitting on a jump seat for a flight attendant after 30 plus years is <laughs> breathing and this it was like of course yeah okay she's on a jump seat but I mean I thought about that a jump seat she's on the phone but there are no air phones that, that you know reach to door three right jump seat and we they certainly weren't put on for us to talk to people because we're busy doing in-flight service you know giving people CPR and Heimlich technique and uh, you know cokes and seven ups and dinners and kosher meals and you know all of that stuff defibrillating even I mean my goodness we've got a lot of stuff going on and we're, those phones were not put there for us so <laughs> we're not we sit in our jump seats by the way <laughs> for two reasons takeoff and landing and why is that why do we sit on our hands so we don't break our arms and that we can open those darn doors and get your butts out of this passenger seat and evacuate the plane that's why we sit there that's why we sit on our hands so their arms are not flailing Years ago, I have to admit, when I first started flying, we weren't so safety conscious as we later on became. And every time there was a crash or an incident, and we, uh, the FAA and the airline safety people do a briefing with the crew members. What went wrong? What went right? And that's how we would get new commands and that sort of thing. So <clears throat> years ago, like in the 70s, I mean, we used to take off holding a cup of coffee. <laughs> All those early morning flights, sitting in on the 727 and bouncing down the runway and just letting your arm go up and down so you don't spill your coffee. Uh, but that that all changed when, uh, you know, something happened and some flight attendant broke her arms and couldn't help anybody get off the plane. So that, that kind of stuff all changed eventually and as uh, the safety standards kind of got better and better over the uh, decades. So... Anyway, that's why we sit on our hands. If you see a flight attendant, if you're sitting near a flight attendant on an airplane and she's uh, sitting on her hands, it's not because she's nervous. <laughs> it's an FAA directive to so keep our uh, arms from flailing around because you got to open those doors and, you know, sometimes you have to pull a, uh, a chute open manually um, or... You know, sometimes you're over water, you've got the, that chute becomes a raft. You've got to be able to get the knife and cut the lanyard if the plane's starting to sink. You know, there's all kinds of stuff. You need both arms for this. <laughs> so that's why we've, you know, kind of come around to that. So anyway, I just, I was amazed as I was writing this blog. And so I just thought I'd share that with you because as much as I've, as deep as I've gone into 9-11, as much stuff as I've found... And as much stuff has been brought to me by other people, it just blew my mind that I, <laughs> why didn't I see that before? Uh, Betty Ong should never have sat in a jump seat. She should have found a, and there was a hundred empty seats. So she should have sat in a passenger seat. So what was that all about? Anyway, so the whole, the question was, 
if the crew members were involved in a faked hijacking, then why didn't they follow protocol? Well, here's why. The protocols were set up and they were very effective to end successfully a hijack attempt, which is getting the plane on the ground and getting all the passengers safely off the and crew safely off the plane. But if you were the CIA and you wanted to completely fake the hijacking, because you've already landed the plane at Westover, for example, for Betty Ong, you know, she said, to, one of the things she said was, well, I don't know, but we might be being hijacked. Well, why are you sitting in your jump seat? What about that pepper spray or mace you just said? Who has that? If you are so confused after somebody sprayed pepper spray or mace and you can't get up there because you can't breathe up there, I'm like, wait a minute. Why are you sitting in your jump seat not doing your flight attendant duties? And then you say you don't know if you're being hijacked or not? Well, that's because the plane was on the ground. So all of these details that would you know, normally happen. But so when you look at success... The success for the CIA and for the faked hijacking to get the planes landed and to allow enough time for them to get on that 757 to fly out of the country, which is what they did, it, enough time for all of that to go. They, they didn't follow protocol, nor did the um, air traffic controllers. They waited for almost a half an hour after they lost contact they about 20 minutes before they even started to think about calling the mil military in. <laughs> like, we have no radio contact with Flight 11. Hmm, that's interesting. Well, let's just keep on going. I'm going out for coffee. Uh, you know, it's like, wait a minute. I mean, this should have happened instantaneously within six minutes or less because Otis Air Force Base was scrambled and it's right there. Well, probably three minutes and that airplane would have had two F-15s on its wingtips and they would have landed the plane. But that's not what they wanted. Success for the CIA was a complete Operation Northwoods version 2.0, a faked hijacking to start the wars. And so that's kind of what happened. So when you're looking at success, success in a real hijacking would have been scrambling the planes, the, the air traffic controllers doing their job correctly. And none of those people lost their jobs. That's always amazed me in the, in the uh, Pentagon, uh, in the uh, NORAD and the air traffic control system in Boston and New York, none of them that didn't do their job correctly, none of them lost their job. But almost every one of them got promoted. And yeah, they didn't even get reprimanded. No, no, there was absolutely nothing. And so I always found that really uh, fascinating because it then led me to look a little closer at the involvement because listen, if you fail the passengers on those planes and the people in those towers as badly as we were led to believe happened, now, even though that's not what happened, we were led to believe that. So if you really in real life failed to do your job that badly, then uh, you would expect to lose your job or be reprimanded, right? But most of those people got a promotion. And that always kind of bothered me. And it always made me think, okay, well, so some of these people did know. Uh, they did know what was going on. Yes, indeed, they did. But, you know, when you're threatened with the life of your children or your parents or, you know, your everything. I mean, this the government has the power, uh, really, to, you know kill your pets, kill your kids, whatever, and um, silence you. And so I think that's when we, um, now we all begin to see, like I'm experiencing personally, people that knew things. Maybe they weren't too deeply involved, but they saw things that weren't right uh, by the government, by our military, by air traffic controllers, etc. It's just like finding the meta tags so that we saw radar for these planes the supposedly that were completely faked and uploaded before the crash, before takeoff. I mean, it's right there in the FOIA data that they're meta tagging when they were uploaded to the FAA headquarters. Now consider this, that the, some of the tapes out of the Boston Center, Air Traffic Control Center from Nashua, New Hampshire, uh, we have those in the timeline and the chronologies also in the FOIA data 
that uh, the broken protocol again, normally in normal circumstances, the uh, FAA would take those tapes and then the National Transportation Safety Board, the NTSB would also get a copy and together those two FAA, the Federal Aviation and the National Transportation Safety Board would look at what happened, at when the plane took off, and when those voice files happened, what that guy said, what kind of accent he spoke in, all of that stuff. But on 9-11, and it's, in the, it's right there in text, that you can't deny it, the FBI came around and confiscated all the air traffic controllers' tapes from New York that weren't d destroyed, from New York, uh, from New York Center, from... Uh, Boston Center, which Boston Air Traffic Control Center is in Nashua, New Hampshire, not, you know, just kind of north and west of Boston. So after the plane takes off uh, and they talk to the controllers, they, and once they take off, it doesn't take very long, just a few minutes, and then they hand you over, it's called a handoff, uh, to the Air Traffic Control Center, and that center will take you to the next center. So you, depending upon where you're going, you leave Boston Air Center and go to, say, for New York Center. And then uh, if you, you know, keep going somewhere else, you'll go into Indy, Indy Center, Cleveland Center, and there's centers all around. So these, these guys would eventually, over the course of their flight from Boston to California, or from the East Coast to California, would, would be handed over to many centers. So anyway, so the uh, Boston Center, and it's really the Boston Center that waited uh, from about uh, nine minutes after uh, depend. I mean, it's a, it's a minute or two, either way. Some, between 9 and 11 minutes after 8, there was no radio contact with Flight 11. But it wasn't until about 8.45 or so that the airplanes were set out to scramble and the airplane supposedly crashed into the North Tower at 8.46. So you can see there's a real problem here from... Uh, you know, nearly a 35 minute delay. And I'm, t I'm telling you, I've had a jet scrambled for me before, and it shouldn't take more than six minutes and probably even less considering that Otis Air Force Base is just south, right there at Cape Cod, just south of Boston. So uh, in, in that time when they just, they had no radio contact, uh, you know, the, those people that were in Boston Air Traffic Control Center just didn't do their job correctly. Now, why? I don't know. It could have been the fact that they, and I, even though I, I know that this was going on, I haven't seen any data in anything that I have. That doesn't mean it's not there because a the terabyte's a lot of stuff and a lot of the files are uh, uh, titled or given a different number. And so it's there. It's just I maybe haven't found it yet, but they haven't. There hasn't been anything in there that I've seen that the air traffic controllers were told about the military uh, drills going on. Even though there were several military drills going on, including being uh, one of their military drills um, was commercial airplanes being hijacked and flown into buildings that day. So I haven't seen anything in print about them being notified, but that doesn't mean they weren't notified the day before. Um, but but the, the war games were going on. So maybe part of this whole thing was they didn't do their job because they maybe they didn't believe it was real time, but still, there's no excuse. I'm sorry. But if a commercial plane goes uh, uh, no radio contact, uh, the air traffic controller that didn't do his job should have lost his job but he didn't. And so things like that, and I saw, okay, well, if you're going to get a promotion for failing to do your job and save people's lives, then we have to look at who you're working for, right? So that's kind of one of those things that made me see, even though I have to say this, and I'm going to sit down really hard and say this to you. As a professional airline employee for over 30 years, I never, ever dreamed that I would find what I found and uncovered in the Freedom of Information Act data, the information that other aviators and other uh, a, uh, airline employees have brought forward to me. I never dreamed ever that the eyewitnesses that saw where the planes landed, that those were in, the people that were involved were involved and I never ever dreamed that the CIA would have hired airline 
flight attendants and pilots to play a hoax on you and me. I never, ever dreamed that. As a matter of fact, when I, I remember when my first book came out, somebody asked me, do you think the airline or the crew were involved in this? And I had so much cognitive dissonance that I would not have believed it until I had a rather long conversation with a family member of a crew member who told me that his parent, a flight attendant, on 9-11, on one of the four planes, told him that he had, been ex he had been offered a special job with the CIA, and that if he took that job, it meant that he could never, ever see his son again. And that's not how the CIA works. And he was uh, a crew member. He's supposed to be dead now. And his son just wanted to know, what do you think? What do I think? What did I? I said, well, what do you think? Your dad was a black belt in martial arts. Do you think in his airline uniform he wouldn't have kicked butt on these little hijacker guys? Because they were like five foot five, uh, supposedly according to the story. Although, lo and behold, the passenger manifests have shown up. And guess what? There's no Arabs on the real passenger manifest. The only thing you've ever seen is what the FBI wants you to believe. So we've got all these government agencies working to, to spoof you on 9-11. And that explains why all those people, whether they were in the military, in the Pentagon, um, generals or uh, air traffic controllers, never lost their job. And most of them got a promotion because it was a success for the United States government to pull off a complete and total hoax. But lo well, oh and behold, for, for uh, book number four, have we uncovered the craziest stuff in the world? So when George Norrie asked me, do you really believe that? Yeah, because we have the data. And guess what? We found the hijackers. Some of them are still alive. And they're in book four. So if you ever wondered about 9-11, ever, ever wondered what was really going on, I will invite you now to come and join us at BehindTheGalleyCurtain.com. And you can get a 30% discount if you read right above where you're going to check which, which uh, class of service, first class, business class, coach class, or economy, which is 12 months, six months, three months, or one. And you can do a reoccurring payment if you want to come in one month at a time. It's like $6, okay? And if you come in for a year, it's around 4 bucks. And you can come and get all the information, all the questions asked. You can get a discount on the books in our online bookstore. And you can uh, deal with this because here's the thing that I think that the majority of thinking people across the world, because I actually, <laughs> I have sold books, uh, autographed books, I bet to 25 countries at least. I, I know you sold some books to Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And all over in Jerusalem, too. And um, it's been kind of fascinating to see. Right? I, I know there's some that have gone to Norway and to Sweden and Spain, all, all, just all over. And, it, you know, it's fascinating to me because a, a lot of people say, well, how come people are so dumb they, don't, they believe this? Well, you know, I'm finding that the majority of thinking people, not everybody can do that, but the majority of thinking people, the smart people, saw that on the, the at the Pentagon there was no airplane parts and that tail section, that back end of that airplane would have been right there on the lawn. They also saw in Shanksville no airplane parts and they heard from the coroner up there, uh, small town coroner, but you know, I mean, he's a coroner. There was, he said, this is an airplane crash. There was no bodies, no body parts, no nothing. Well, speaking of thinking people, how many emails or letters have you received from people that said, or that have said, I knew from the very get-go that there was something wrong with this? Oh, yeah. Thinking people around the world are, are aware. They didn't see a plane crash at Shanksville and the Pentagon, and there was no way of knowing what happened, but we can look at, and a lot of people are doing this now because hindsight is always twenty twenty. And even though we were all traumatized, I was too, watching it unfold on television for many reasons. But as an insider in the airline, I, I just couldn't believe that some Middle Eastern person in a, living in a tent could manage to control NORAD. I mean, 
And how did they get those aluminum planes to fly through a skyscraper? When I saw what uh, was supposed to be United 175, we now know that it was on the ground. But um, because we have eyewitnesses that saw it land. So when I saw that, my first reaction was, this is some kind of really bad fake photography. Uh, because an airplane wouldn't go through and it just kind of poofs like a little puff ball <laughs> as it goes through the building. I'm like, no, that's not way it happened. It would have exploded on the outside and fallen down to all the people on, on the ground, on the street around New York. And everybody in the airline industry knows that because we study crashes every year in our recurrent training. But that was my initial thought. because I, And I, it left me that day very confused. How did they get the airplane to go through a building? Because that's not how what happens when planes hit things. Well, and about, in Shanksville, too. How about the fact that two airplanes supposedly hit the World Trade Tower and all seven buildings in the World Trade Center were destroyed? How'd that happen? <laughs> how many people have asked you that question? <laughs> well, yeah. And, and what's amazing is in the 9-11 Commission hearings, they never even mentioned the Solomon Building, Building 7. But what's really crazy is Ehud Barak... Israeli, was in the BBC studios that morning, and um, one of their BBC reporters, uh, I think her name was Jane Stanley, but I'm not positive on her name, she was standing somewhere with the Solomon Building standing behind her, telling us, telling the BBC audience, that the Solomon Building had fallen down and collapsed. That was Building 7. But it hadn't, and it was standing right behind her still, and there's pictures of that all over the internet. It didn't fall down for until 5.20 that afternoon, having not been hit by any airplane. But how did Ehud Barak know it was going to come down just like a controlled demolition? How did he know that? He probably knew from the same source that told him that it was uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Osama bin Laden that caused the problem. Exactly, because he, at the same time he told us that the Solomon building had already fallen when it hadn't, is that he was also saying that this was now the war on terror and this was Osama bin Laden behind this. How did he know that? You know, he'd been in New York the night before that. Uh-huh. Wow. I mean, it's such an amazing story, the whole 9-11 thing. But what I found is that people that are smart, they really kind of knew from the get-go. Or, or maybe as things started coming out uh, two or three years later. And a lot of it coincided with Dr. Stephen Jones from BYU. He's a physicist who uh, found nanothermite explosive in the dust along with thermite. And now you can see, if you look at pictures of the uh, rubble pile, you can see the 45 degree uh, thermite cuts for the columns, the core columns. They're right there behind the firefighters are sitting right there in the pile. And so how do you explain that? How do you explain nanothermite? And why is it that there's some crazy woman that well, has written a very expensive book and had this really weird theories uh, about a hurricane and stuff like that. Why is it that nanothermite sets her off so bad? Because nanothermite really was found in the dust. Well, because nanothermite is only available to the United States government, and I believe the government of Israel also has access to it. So if we find it in the dust, and it's an explosive that's only available to the United States government... Who do you think put it there? It wasn't found inside of the uh, sheetrock in the walls or the concrete floors or the aluminum siding. It is not something that could be created by computers being dustified or uh, destroyed by jet fuel. How do you explain finding nanothermite and thermite explosives in the dust? I'll give you just a second to figure out who that was, right? And so, you know, I, I think what's happening now is people, and I don't know, maybe hindsight is twenty twenty. so we're starting to lift the veil. And one of the things I think that's really helped people understand what in the world is going on is that we're actually watching the same people, the CIA, the Mo Israeli Mossad, the um, MI6, they were all involved in 9-11, by the way, and the FBI, 
all involved in a coup against the sitting government of the United States, President Donald Trump. And as this gets more and more exposed, which it will as soon as they declassify the FISA warrants as they were spying on the Trump administration, even after the election, these are the same people that planned and perpetrated the hoax of 9-11. If you don't believe that, and I think this is one thing that got George Norrie, you just need to Google search uh, or you know, DuckDuckGo search or whatever search engine you like on your computer, Operation Northwoods, and you will see that everything that transpired on 9-11 and for the 17 years of war after 9-11 was originally planned in the early 1960s to use against Cuba. They were going to do the same thing, including assassinations, terrorist attacks inside the United States of America by our covert CIA and military special forces. Same people, same people that were involved in 9-11. And so they were going to set up a fake hijacking of a commercial plane. Yeah, hello, 9-11, right there. And John F. Kennedy saw this. And by the way, just like 9-11, Operation Northwoods was planned by the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. You'll find him in book three, Methodical Conclusion. Uh -huh, you will. Because here, you guess where he was on 9-11 when American Flight 11 disappeared from radar? Mm-hmm. On the speckled trout, the 707, that was electronically equipped to run a war anywhere around the world, could make a phone call anywhere around the world, could even make an airplane disappear from radar, could even jam their radio, radio system. Yeah, could even just handle just about all the things we saw happen on 9-11. Yep, right there, right there. But you know what he said? He said he was way out over the Atlantic, but I have his flight plan. He didn't make it <laughs> over the Atlantic. He left Andrews Air Force Base. You guys can look this up because in Methodical Illusion, I teach you how to do this. You can look it up on uh, Airplane Manager and a Flight Calculator, airplanemanager.com, Flight Calculator from Andrews Air Force Base. Go ahead and look and see how, how long it takes him to go to uh, Westover Air Force Base. And the code for that is CEF, like in Charlie Elephant Frank. That's Westover. You can see how, far it how long it takes him to get there. How close is that to uh, 10 minutes after 8? Mm -hmm. He left uh, about 11 minutes after 7. Yeah, I have his radar. I have his plane <laughs> on radar. But what he said... General Hugh Shelton, what he said in his book, he wrote a book. I mean, this is all kind of crazy. He said he was on his way to Brussels to a, some kind of NATO meeting or something, and that he was way out over the Atlantic on his way to Europe. That's not true. And so, you know, I had to ask myself, self, why would the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff lie about where he was? What do you think he was really doing, self? So then I started to look, and that's when I found his radar, I found his real flight path, and I have all that stuff. Yeah, I bet they probably would like to kill me, wouldn't they? <laughs> oh, well, it's all out there now. Um, but, you know, I, I, I'm getting so many uh, emails from people when they finish reading book four, especially if you read it on a Kindle, <laughs> that it just stops. <laughs> like, I didn't know that was the last page. Oh, my God. Uh, so... Please write another one. Uh, and you know, uh, it's amazing as it was when I was on the phone waiting for George Norrie to do his news broadcast part, the first part of the show. Um, I was actually in contact with somebody that was giving me more new information. It was an airline employee. And uh, I'm like, well, maybe this information is just going to keep coming, keep coming and keep coming. So uh, I really would like to write a, a book five. The series goes one through uh, four right now, and they literally take off where the last book left you. So start with methodical illusion, go to deception, conclusion, and then exposure, because the real truth is exposed in those four books. As hard as it was for me to handle, personally, as an aviation person, as an airline employee for decades, uh, as hard as that was, 
Uh, and I, I honestly can say I probably would never have believed it had I not had a conversation with an airline crew member from 9-11 who admitted to taking a job with the CIA. I, I wouldn't have believed it. So I have a new uh, found perspective on reality. Yes, I do. And you will, too, when you finish reading these uh, books, because uh, it's, a, it's a hard uh, thing to face, I think, for all of us. But yet, it, it, the, it, the amazing thing is for me is how many people tell me after they've read maybe even one book, right? It's a lot of times people just contact me as I've just finished book one, I've just finished book two, and, and they're, you know, have their comments. Uh, but how many people tell me that they always questioned 9-11? And there were so many conspiracy nuts that were out there denying nanothermite or creating just crazy, goofy conspiracy theories. And a lot of those are mentioned in book four. And then uh, also a lot of people wanted to know about me. There's a character in there that a lot of the stuff has happened by people who have trolled me on the internet thinking I'm somebody else. And it's just, it got to a point of pure insanity. And so that a lot of that's in book four too. Uh, but I think you'll find it, it's interesting. There's a new flight attendant character that comes in. They are novels. So if you can't handle a novel, don't buy these books. Don't read them. And don't, you know, buy them. They are novels. If you're just too manly for that, then don't go there. <laughs> but don't send me an email bitching at me that I wrote novels, okay? Because I'm going to knock your socks off when I write the nonfiction book, if I ever decide to do that. I, mean, I have to take a break. But now, right now, I'm, my mind right now is really spinning because this went so deep in book four uh, in the involvement and then... I think that when you finish reading all four books, there'll be no doubt in your mind that there's no such thing as coincidence. And remember, Operation uh, Northwoods is, was going to be successful because Operation Mockingbird, which is still in effect, which is the CIA's total control of the media, and some of the control is alternative media. So some of these, uh, you know, larger... Uh, alternative radio, internet radio things and stuff. They, they're, they're controlled opposition. They're controlled. Let me ask you a hypothetical question. In Operation Northwoods, Kennedy shut that down. Now, Kennedy was assassinated shortly thereafter, and it probably wasn't just for Operations Northwood, but I'm sure it had something to do with it. If George W. Bush had a shut down 9-11, which he probably could have done because I'm sure he was aware of it, even though he didn't plan it, do you think they would have killed him? Uh, well, you know, the wars in the Middle East that we've been involved in now for 17 years were planned uh, prior to 9-11. One of the uh, things I mentioned in the very first book is the Project for New American Century. And you guys can look that up. It's even, they have a Wikipedia page. You can see who signed it. And this was a white paper written in, I believe, uh, originally 98, 99, uh, given to Bill Clinton. Now, keep in mind that Bill and Hillary were in the White House for eight years before 9-11. So when all of this stuff was being planned, all of the wars, all of this stuff was being planned, the Clinton global initiative the clinton foundation the, the uh all of this stuff was planned uh, everything that was planned for the wars and lockheed martin and the uh, raytheon and bae systems and all of this stuff they all knew this was coming because the wars were pre-planned and the project for new american century it's often referred to as pnac called for get this a new Pearl Harbor to rally the American people toward war with the Middle East. That's why it was a collection of Saudis. Well, we never went to war with Saudi, but there were supposedly 15 of the hijackers were supposed to be Saudis, although now we know that 10 of them are still alive and they never have even been to this country, still to this day. Uh, there was one, uh, I believe, one Egyptian, one from Oman, and I think one from Yemen originally was the FBI's story. 
There were no Iraqis and there were no Afghanis, but those were the countries we wanted to go to war with. So they had to cook up the yellow cake and all of the crazy weapons of mass destruction. We all know now because hindsight is twenty twenty, and the truth always does prevail. It will always prevail. The truth will always prevail. May take a while. It may have taken 20 years, but the truth is prevailing. And people are waking up to it. And so uh, they're starting now to see. I mean, you can see the ongoing coup right now uh, with what's going on against President Trump. Whether you like him or not, 65 million people or so voted for the guy. He won the election. So guess what? That's what we got to go through, whether you like it or not. Um, but the same people that were involved with 9 11, the same people that also were arranging to do Operation Northwoods, yeah, these are the same people. And it's the same thing. Terrorist attacks yeah, are on our own soil? Well, what do you think 9 11 was? But who did it? Same people who were planning Operation Northwoods pulled off 9 11. The same people who were going to cover it all up because that's how it works. That's how, that's what they, basically the FBI is basically the mop-up crew. That's what, they, that's what they do. And they're very corrupt. You can see that now because we've already seen how many of them have lost their job because they got busted planning a coup d'etat on uh, Donald Trump and his administration. Spying. This is conspiracy of sedition. This is treason. And these are FBI guys and CIA. Don't think John Brennan's not involved in all this stuff. And, so, and you got a clapper. And they were all in positions prior to and during 9-11. Yeah, it's amazing. So, you know, I guess when you, when you sit down and think about this and, you know, find um, comfort in a sense of knowing that the truth always comes to light. It always does. And it is right now. And I think we're watching it unfold and i think that's maybe why maybe it's just the time of season it is that people are waking up to something other than what we were told and shown on 9 11 is the truth and so that's what i found and you know i have to say this and on closing when i started as an airline professional looking at 9 11 and found the first thing i found was at least 10 of the hijackers were alive and that our own government, including people that were the attorney generals and the head of the, uh, Robert Mueller was the head of the FBI, uh, that were in the head of law enforcement, you know, national uh, attorney general across the country, blah, 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 that actually admitted that the other nine that we don't know that are alive could be completely fake, false identities, stolen identities not even real existing people well that explains why they weren't on the real passenger manifest for either united or american that explains it perfectly because they weren't there and so <laughs> it's just fascinating for me to look at this but i looked at this thinking it was 19 radical muslims that did it i didn't think i was going to find uh the cia the israeli Mossad, the british mi6 uh, GCH cures, uh, but look at what I just said. These are the same people that are involved in the ongoing coup against the sitting president of the United States right now and the FBI. Don't forget the FBI, because like I said, it was the FBI that ran up to Nashua, New Hampshire on their little helicopters. I've got them right there on radar and picked up the tapes that the FAA should have been picking up that should have been ha then handed. That's the normal chain of command. How do I know that? Because air traffic controllers came that have dealt with these crashes. And they were like, what the hell is the FBI picking up this stuff for? Because normally, and that's that protocol that we kept seeing broken. And why was it broken? Well, the real telltale thing to me was finding a wave file, MP3 voice file marked terrorist that was copyrighted by the FAA, uploaded to the FAA headquarters computers in washington dc at 6 37 a.m on 9 11 2001 marked terrorists saying in an israeli accent we have some planes we are going back to the airport that guy wasn't on the plane and then you take it from there and you just go with it and what i had to do was just sort of drop all pre preconceived notions especially that the crew 
and some of the passengers were involved in the in the hoax that was 9-11. So there you go. That's a flight attendant's 9-11 story, and I'm sticking to it. And I'm going to tell you more. So come and join us over at Behind the Galley Curtain. If you can handle the truth, I know a lot of people can't. So if you can't, don't go there. But if you can handle the truth, and if you want to hear, I mean, I, we take apart the daily stuff, and we see what's going on. Um, I'm not a, a Republican or a Democrat. I'm an independent. I'm an independent thinker. And what I've found now uh, in looking at 9-11, I have to look at everything with an open set of eyeballs. And uh, so I'm not going to you know, toot your horn if you're all about hating on Trump, because I'm not. Uh, I'm all about uh, getting the truth out, no matter who it offends. So if it offends your priest or your rabbi or your school teacher or your favorite politician, sorry for you. But that's the way it is. It's going to be the truth. Come over to BehindTheGalleyCurtain.com. Join us over there. And you guys can dive into 9-11 as deep as you want to because there's a ton of information over there. <laughs>